Mr. Baldwin, is this like a self-help session? Are we talking about people's faults here? Because I got a few. Yeah, I've been meaning to bring them up. Uh, it's, it's been getting pretty bad. Let's talk about different kind of faults then, huh? All right. Okay. Uh, by the end of today, you guys should be able to explain how rock is faulted. Not like how it's you know doing things poorly, but how it's faulted. Okay. And then you should be able to compare the major categories of faults and folds in regards to stress, movement, and plate boundaries. Okay. Sounds good. Let's see what we've got here. Okay. We're going to start out with terminology again. More so. vocabulary, yeah. absolutely. So, what you guys should do, if you need to pause this, pause this, but you've got these terms. These are terms we're going to use in the presentation. You guys should be familiar with these. If you need to, pause us so you can actually go back and make sure you know what we're talking about. Okay, just four of them this time. Yep. Fault and fault scarf, hanging wall and footwall. Easy enough. Okay, good. Let's move forward. All right, so first type of fault we're talking about, it's a normal fault. It's definitely not unnormal, but it's normal. Okay. Okay. So if we take a look at this, it says a fault in which the hanging wall moves down relative to the foot wall. Okay. So we might have to talk about the hanging wall foot wall first, just to give people an idea. All right. Okay. Let's use this diagram up here at the top to do that. Awesome. So if you take a look at the diagram, the wall on the left looks like it's slightly, I mean, it's above it, but if you look at the angle, it's going to be below it. Okay. So picture if you drew a hole straight through it, which side would you be walking on? I might have to describe that a little bit better. So if you drill the hole right into the into the fault itself where the rocks have broken, would you be walking on the left side or the right side, Ms. Awad? Well, so we're looking at brittle deformation because the rocks have broken, mm -hmm. right? And the stress here applied was a vertical mm -hmm. stress. So one side is moved up and one side is moved down. Yeah. And we want to know whether it's the hanging wall or the foot wall that mm -hmm. has moved down. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, it is the hanging wall that has dropped down okay. relative to the foot wall. Okay. So the foot wall moved up relative to the hanging wall, or okay. the hanging wall moved down relative to the foot wall. Mm, Same thing. Yeah. So I think it's really important for the students to actually label the hanging wall and foot wall in this diagram. Absolutely, yeah. And then when we show them these pictures here, to label hanging wall and foot wall in these, because that's how you're going to really look for the types of faults. Okay. But let's talk for a second about how they know without having those arrows, yeah. which way they move. So what if the arrows weren't there, what could they use as a reference for movement up or down? Well, I'm looking at those different color layers. We've okay. got, on the left side, a yellow, red, blue, gray. And then they don't quite match up with the ones on the right side, on the hang or on the sorry hanging wall. Um, so we could see which way they moved relative to each other just by moving those colors back. So say if we got those red ones to match up, we'd have to actually move the other one down. That's like the final distance that it moved, was we had to move the red side down compared to the other one. Okay. Let's look at the examples here we have pictures of. So I'm going to look at this one first um, because I think this is easy to look at the different layers. So this is a great reference layer to look at. It's a little bit lighter in color. And if I were taking notes on it, I would probably want to make a mark over here to the right side of this picture. And the same layer to the left side of the picture is just a little bit higher. So at one point, this was one continuous layer. And we can see that there is a fault, and this little person here is standing along that fault. So here's the fault plane where the actual failure occurred. And in this case, the portion of the rock exposed on the right side of the fault has moved down relative to the portion of the rock on the left side. So now we have to determine if the left side or the right side is the hanging wall. Which side do you think is the hanging wall, Mr. Baldwin? Well, if I was looking at it and I wanted to hang something on one of these walls, I would want to hang it on the right side. Yep. And so that's actually how they named it, was in a mine, if you had a hole right here, you would hang your lantern on the one with the angle where the rock's above the angle, and you would walk on the other side, the foot wall. Good. So we have the hanging wall moving down relative to the foot wall, and that's what makes this a normal fault. Okay. What about this diagram? This one looks actually pretty similar. So just like Miss Awad did before, I see a layer right here, and it actually looks a lot really similar to this layer found right across here. Okay? So one thing I would want to do is I would want to draw my line straight across here, 
and then continue it just on the other side, if you can <coughs> see what we're pointing to here. So where's the actual fault plane here? Okay, so right up and down the middle, you can see the fault plane. This is where the brittle deformation took place. Good. The thing I like about this picture is you can actually see the trace or the evidence of the ductile deformation. You see a slight curvature in this layer here <coughs> and down here. So again, we've got another example of a normal fault here. All right, let's go to the next slide. Ah, reverse fault. Do you think that means it's the reverse of normal? I think you're right, absolutely. Okay, well let's look at the diagram. Okay, so if we look at the diagram, the hanging wall, the one where you'd hang your lantern on, has moved up in relationship to, in relation to the foot wall. So it would be like if we had a diagram here. Oh my gosh. If we looked at something like this, we would have our hanging wall moving up in relation to our foot wall. Good. All right, so let's look at the examples. I'll look at this one first. And I like to find the fault first. So here's a high angle fault here. And you can see the layers continuing here on the foot wall and then offset here on the hanging wall. And so in this case, we've got the foot wall moving down relative to the hanging wall, which makes it a reverse fault. You want to talk about the other picture? Yeah. So we'll do like Miss Awad first. We will draw our fault right across the diagonal on this picture here, OK? You can see where the brittle deformation took place. Went all the way from the upper right hand down to the lower left hand, OK? Now we can look at the layers and see how they line up. We've got this big pink band right across the middle. And then it's a lot lower on the right side. So I can see my hanging wall actually moved up compared to my foot wall. Okay. What kind of uh, environment do you think this might happen in? Is this a compressional environment or a tensional environment? Well, one of the big keys that I see here is up on the diagram up top, I see the arrows moving towards each other. So ah. they're converging together. So this is a convergional zone. Okay. And do you think that means that a normal fault would typically form in a divergent? or a tensional environment? Ooh, that one seems a normal. Yep, absolutely. Yep. It would have to be pulling apart for a normal fault to take place. And in fact, lots of places where there are divergent types of plate boundaries, especially places like the East African Rift right now, you can see a lot of normal faulting. Mm -hmm. Great, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, the third type that we see here, notice that they're coming in threes, is a strike-slip fault. Now, now, now we're looking at an aerial map, or an aerial view, of a couple different landscapes. And in the diagram, we see an aerial along with a cross-sectional view. And the arrows are kind of moving past each other. It's kind of like they're rubbing past each other, rubbing mm -hmm. up against each other. So this one's a fault where the motion, it's horizontal. And they say it's along a transform fault. So they kind of gave us the answer on that one. They did, but no hanging, hanging wall and foot wall in this case, because mm -hmm. there is no vertical movement, right? Yep. The movement is all horizontal. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's look at these two pictures. Um, I'm going to start by tracing the fault again, and you're probably going to want to write this down or actually trace over this too. Here's the trace of the actual fault. And if you're ever flying in a plane out west, especially over California, oh. lots of times you can look down and you can actually see faults on the ground that look just like that. So there's the trace of the fault. And we're looking straight down, so we're looking for some horizontal offset in this case. Now, I can see a little bit of a pattern along here and a little bit of a pattern along here where I think there's some offset on that fault. How about this one? Well, this one looks like it's some, court, some sort of farm, maybe a tree farm. And you can see the fault going from the lower left right across to the upper right-hand corner. Okay. Now, imagine being that tree farmer. And every day of your life when you're walking past these trees, you can see right down each of these fields, each of these rows. And now you've got this fault running right across the middle of it. And when you look down, you actually see some of the trees shifted in one direction. Mm -hmm. So you don't have one continuous row anymore. And if you take a look at it, the ones in the upper left-hand corner look like they shifted to the left. The ones in the bottom look like they shifted to the right. OK, so if you are standing down here and you look across the fault, it looks like they moved to the left. Mm -hmm. That would make it a left lateral strike slip fault, mm -hmm. right? And just to check that, if you're standing up here looking across the fault, it's going to look like this it's side moved to the left also. So again, that's going to confirm that it's a left lateral strike slip fault. Yeah, so if you and I were both on the opposite side of the fault, we would both say that we shifted to the left. Good. 
That's it. And there's another kind of lateral strike slip fault, and that would be shifting to the right. right. So it's right lateral or left lateral strike slip fault. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Next slide, please. All yeah. right. Next type of fault we're looking at is a thrust fault. Now, this one looks kind of similar, but there's a little bit of difference. It says the hanging wall moves up and thrusts over the foot wall. So that's got to be a lot of compressional force going on mm -hmm. there. But in this case, different from a reverse fault, you've got a very low angle fault. So if you were to measure the angle of that fault plane, it's going to be less than 45 degrees. Okay. Okay. So let's look at our examples here. Um, this one's a little bit hard to see. Can you find the actual fault in this one? Oh my gosh, this is really tough to see. Where were we miss a lot? We're talking <laughs> about whether this side is the hanging wall that has been thrust oh. up and over. So side. we yeah. see our layers here and actually it was pushed so far over in such a low angle that it actually went up and over the foot wall. Yeah. So let's look at this one too. This one we've got a person standing here which is really nice for scale because this is a much smaller scale situation than this picture. And we can see the fault plane right across here and you can see that the hanging wall here has been pushed up and over the foot wall down here. Okay. Now this is really typical of a fault zone where you've got a lot of debris that's actually marking the fault plane itself. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next picture. Okay, now Ooh. we're talking about domes and basins. Mm. Now they sound like they're pretty similar terms, don't they? I think so. Yeah? So we can talk about a dome being somewhat similar to the arch in an anticline fold, mm -hmm. so we're back to ductile deformation here. Okay. But the difference between a dome and an anticline arch is that the anticline is really just in two dimensions. Okay. Where the dome is really three dimensionally all around. Yeah, I like to think of a big stadium almost yeah. with a big domed top to it. Okay, so it's like a three dimensional anticline, right? So if we were thinking about our Play-Doh lab, you could have a mm -hmm. nice sheet of Play-Doh mm -hmm. and come up from underneath it, press up from underneath it, and you could make that dome structure, right? Okay, yeah. Okay. Now the opposite, think of like a wash basin. Okay, All a right. wash basin is kind of like a big tub. Good. And it's almost like a three dimensional syncline on that. All right. Well, I really like to talk about this picture because this is kind of our region, right? Oh, yeah. So this is a cross-section. Remember we talked earlier about map views looking straight down from an airplane or cross-sections being like a, a side view. Mm -hmm. And if we made a side view from up here in Wisconsin across into Michigan and then back up here into Canada, what we would see going from here to here is that the rock layers are actually bowed down here like in a basin shape. And this is a basin and not a syncline, too, because we've got this turn in here, and we're looking in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. Okay, So it's actually almost like a big tub that's got Michigan right in the middle. Right. But again, in this situation, you have a surface that's been eroded, mm -hmm. so the younger layers are exposed in the center of that basin, and the older rock layers are exposed out on the flanks gotcha. or on the limbs of the basin. But so, that's all created because that surface was eroded, okay. eroded away. Good. Next slide, please. I think we have one more slide here before our mastery check, and this one talks a little bit about something called a hogback. That's really a funny name. It's a great name. Yeah. So if you take a look at the hogbacks, and you know there aren't really many hogs around Illinois, but if you go down south a little bit, if you took a look at a hog and its back, it kind of looks like the mountain ridges that we see right in this diagram here. And one of the things that we see, it's actually we have angled rock strata mm -hmm. and over time we start getting erosion and that erosion takes place and the more resistant rocks end up making the peaks of all the mountains okay and then the less ones start to erode away so we end up getting kind of like these razor edges across the landscape all right so we can see some of those now this is a picture of the flat irons out in boulder i think and you can see the hard resistant layers have remained behind where some of the softer more easy to erode layers have been eroded away. So these remain behind as the hogbacks. And I think in this one you can see a really good example of a hogback just protruding up like that out of the softer yeah, surface. The side with the trees looks like it's more of that more resistant rock mm -hmm. layer. And then the softer, more, less, resist, or less resistant layers actually got eroded away. Yeah, good. 
All right. I think we're ready for the, uh, the mastery check here. Let's do this. So what are they going to do today? So what they're going to do is you guys need to compare and contrast the process of folding and folds with the process of faulting and faults. Okay, so we're going to compare and contrast. Good thing to do is make a T-chart or a Venn diagram. Absolutely. You can use a Google drawing to do that, and uh, don't forget to add that item to your ePortfolio. Okay. All right. See you in class tomorrow. We'll see you guys later. Have a great night.